Chapter 28 had a lot of different stages of early development that we covered. We also talked about things that could affect fertilization. We talked about different types of stem cells and how that related to twinning. And we talked about the development of a few organ systems, such as the nervous system and the reproductive tract. In the fetal circulatory system, oxygenated blood from the placenta enters the right side of the heart. Because the lungs are not receiving any oxygen, only enough blood needs to be sent up the pulmonary trunk to keep the lung cells alive. Two major ducts allow this oxygenated blood to skip the pulmonary circuit and instead enter the left side of the heart to be pumped out the aorta. The foramen ovale connects the right atrium to the left atrium, and the ductus arteriosus connects the two major arteries, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. This allows blood to short circuit the pathway and go right to the body rather than to the lungs. At birth, the increased pressure in the thoracic cavity caused by the lungs inflating for the first time help to compress these ducts and shut them. Eventually, they scar over. After ovulation occurs, the egg will survive for one to two days in the fallopian tubes. Sperm, similarly, can survive in the female reproductive tract for one to two days. They will usually swim up the fallopian tube to fertilize the egg in the ampulla region. It will then take about a week for this zygote, as it undergoes early stages of development, to reach the endometrium of the uterus. At this point, the embryo would implant into the endometrium, and the endometrial cells would start secreting the hormone HCG. This hormone is only produced after implantation. This hormone can wind up in the bloodstream and eventually in the urine, and this is the basis for a pregnancy test. It's going to take at least a week before a pregnancy test could work, because we have to wait for implantation, hormone production, and for the hormone to be filtered out by the kidneys and into the urine. Otherwise, it's a very accurate test, because humans do not produce HCG except after implantation has occurred. The development of sex and gender frequently appears binary, but it really is a multi-step process that occurs along a spectrum. Initially, genetic sex is determined by the presence or absence of a Y chromosome, or more specifically, the SRY gene, which exists only on the Y chromosome. XY will drive male development whereas the absence of the Y chromosome will drive female development. The first organs to respond to this difference are the gonads. The Y chromosome will drive development of the gonads into testes, whereas its absence will lead to the formation of ovaries. Early in development, the testes can start producing testosterone, whereas ovaries do not produce any hormones at this time. It's the presence or absence of testosterone that'll drive the next step of development, which is development of the genitalia. Testosterone will lead the genital tubercle to grow in size, resembling a penis, whereas the labial scrotal swellings will grow and fuse together, forming a scrotum. In the absence of testosterone, the genital tubercle will remain smaller and appear like a clitoris whereas the labial scrotal swellings will remain a separate pair of labia. Estrogen would have no effects at this time. It's not until later. Testosterone continues to drive development of the central nervous system. In fact, some of that testosterone can be converted into estrogen, and both of these hormones can masculinize the brain. This is a very complicated process, even more so than development of the genitalia, and even the genitalia can be complex if you go back and look at ambiguous genitalia in the lecture. The absence of testosterone and estrogen, on the other hand, would drive female development. 
These processes are numerous and extend over a broad period of time. For this reason, we have concern for fetuses and newborns being exposed to chemicals that could mimic testosterone or estrogen. One common chemical was BPA, found in plastics. This chemical can act like estrogen, although not very strongly. Nevertheless, it's possible that BPAs could lead to masculinization of a developing fetal brain. It should have no effects on the formation of the gonads, which were under control of the SRY gene on the Y chromosome, or the development of the genitalia, which were strictly under the control of testosterone or the absence of testosterone. Furthermore, because human genitalia develop from the same structure, it's not possible for humans to be true hermaphrodites, meaning having functioning sets of both reproductive organs. It is, however, possible for human genitalia to be ambiguous, partially male and partially female. This is caused by excess testosterone in genetic females, or not enough testosterone signaling in genetic males. I say genetic because at this point we could only determine the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. Altered testosterone levels would affect the brain and therefore also affect somebody's gender identity. And determining a newborn's gender identity is not possible. With just two exceptions, males and females have all the same parts. They're just shaped a little bit differently and possibly in a different location. Those two exceptions arise from the malarian ducts and the wolfian ducts. Initially, the fetus makes both, but then testosterone should allow the wolfian ducts to survive and drive the destruction of the malarian ducts. Those wolfian ducts will turn into the vas deferens. Conversely, the absence of testosterone allows the wolfian ducts to degrade, but the malarian ducts survive to turn into the fallopian tubes and the uterus. These are the only two structures that do not have homologs between males and females. Early development is characterized by rapid rounds of mitosis. As the cells divide, they get smaller, but otherwise they are not changing. These cells are considered omnipotent stem cells. They are capable of giving rise to any and all tissues in the human body. If in these early stages of development, the embryo were to be damaged, the cells could easily be replaced. In fact, if the embryo was split in half, with a few more rounds of cell division, you would now have two complete genetically identical embryos that could develop into monozygotic twins. These embryos would continue through develop normally. Eventually, the cells will begin to differentiate. Differentiation begins at the gastrula stage, when some of the cells migrate to the interior of the embryo. These cells will now become the inner linings of the body, whereas the cells on the outside become the outer lining. Next up, some cells migrate to the middle of these two, forming mesoderm. If any of these cells were lost, that would lead to an embryo that could not make an entire range of structures, and it would die. So after these stages, forming monozygotic twins is not possible because the cells have begun to differentiate and have decided what they're going to become 